tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture. Appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibuster. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games... You've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, li- li- listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's the evening of Friday, November 22nd, 1963. Earlier that day in Dallas, President Kennedy had been shot. After the doctors at Parkland Hospital feverishly tried to save his life, at approximately 1 p.m., he was officially pronounced dead. The president's body was then loaded onto Air Force One, flown to Washington, and taken to Bethesda Naval Medical Center where a team of pathologists began not just the most important autopsy of their careers, but the most important autopsy in American history. 36 hours later, pathologists Dr. J. Thornton Boswell and Dr. James Humes concluded their work. Dr. Humes finished the autopsy report at home. Now, he fully understands the importance of this report. It'll be a central piece of the official record that describes how the president was killed. It will be part of history, and it has to be precise. But here's what he tells the Warren Commission the following year. Now, Soledad, could you read this? It's Dr. Humes describing what he did that evening. Dr. Humes says, quote, In the privacy of my own home, early in the morning of Sunday, November 24th, I made a draft of this report, which I later revised, and of which this represents the revision. That draft I personally burned in the fireplace of my recreation room. Okay, could could you repeat that last sentence? That draft I personally burned in the fireplace of my recreation room. So he's admitting to the Warren Commission that he burned the original draft of the report, then made a revised draft. And once the revelation that Humes had burned the original copy of the autopsy, he had to continue to defend himself. In 1992, Dr. Humes told the New York Times that the original copy was stained with blood, and he didn't want it to become a, quote, ghoulish collector's item. He insisted that the second report was copied verbatim word for word, from the draft he burned. If it was only about accepting the lame excuse of preserving the president's dignity, we might buy it. But burning the autopsy report wasn't the only thing about the forensic investigation that was suspicious, starting with the two so-called forensic pathologists that were in charge. Humes and Boswell were not forensic pathologists. That's Doug Horn. From 1995 to 1998, he was a senior staff member of the President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Review Board, and he's an expert on the case. Now, it should be troubling to everybody who studies this case that the two people selected to be the number one and number two pathologist 
These guys were pathologists who did deaths due to natural causes. So Humes and Boswell really weren't qualified to be doing this autopsy, and yet they were picked. So you have two doctors who are not certified nor qualified in forensic pathology, and the lead doctor throws his notes into the fireplace before handing in a revised draft. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. This is Who Killed JFK? 60 years later, what can we uncover about the greatest murder mystery in American history? And why does it still matter today? I'm your host, Soledad O'Brien. In the last episode, we learned that it was the intent of the Warren Commission to prove that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin of President Kennedy. Alan Dulles, the godfather of the CIA, was placed on the commission to make sure that any damning information about the CIA was kept hidden. J. Edgar Hoover ignored evidence that might implicate anyone other than Oswald. Then, in 1976, after learning that the Warren Commission had been compromised, the House Select Committee on Assassinations launched a new investigation. And though they were able to expose more than the Warren Commission had, they too learned afterwards that their efforts had been compromised because the liaison to the CIA that they were given was a man named George Joannides. He was a retired CIA agent who oversaw the special ops program that had recruited Lee Harvey Oswald. And Joannides made sure that the new committee never knew about that. And although the House investigation concluded that Kennedy was killed as a result of a conspiracy, they came to no conclusion as to who took part in it. The result, two flawed government investigations with two completely different conclusions. So where does it leave us? Well, first let's look at the forensics how the victim died. After that, we'll take a look at the man who they claim did it. We'll dive into Oswald's world. We'll find out who he really was, who he may have been working for, how he was set up, and who could have pulled this off. Then we'll have it all unfold again, from the days leading up to the assassination to the moment that Jack Ruby silenced Oswald. Except this time, When we ultimately relive it, we'll know the forces hiding in the shadows behind it all. Okay, so let's get into this. In any murder case, the forensic evidence is critical. It paints the picture of how the victim died. And in this case, to prove a single gunman, the forensic evidence should be straightforward. But trust me, it's far from that. The bullets, the gun, the photographs, the doctor's firsthand reports are all heavily disputed. And in this episode, we're going to go through all of that. As I said, like any other murder, you need to understand the forensic evidence. Forensic evidence it mattered because it was essential in determining the site from which the shot was fired. That's the key to the case. That's Dr. Cyril Wecht, renowned forensic pathologist. The Warren Commission report saying that Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole assassin, the sole shooter, and that he fired from behind, uh, from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository building, and that there were no other shooters. That's the essence of the case. Because once you show two shooters, then you've got, of course... A conspiracy. So let's take a look. According to the Warren report, Oswald fired three shots. How did they arrive at that number? It was based on two initial pieces of evidence. One was the Dallas police report, and the second was the Zapruder film. Remember, the Dallas dressmaker, Abraham Zapruder, got the whole thing on camera. The Zapruder film has no sound, so you, you can't hear the shots but you can see the president being hit twice. And you can also see Governor Connolly sitting in the passenger seat in front of Kennedy 
also getting hit. The Zapruder film clearly shows three hits. So the Warren Commission established three shots. Unfortunately for them, there was a bystander named James Tegg. That's Dr. David Mantic. Dr. Mantic has made nine visits to the National Archives, where the president's x-rays, autopsy photos, and other critical evidence sits available for select members of the public to review. You could try to get an appointment to see them, or you could read any of the three books Dr. Mantic has written about them. According to Dr. Mantic, this bystander was about to create a huge problem for the Warren Commission. James Tegg was standing under the overpass to the left front of the limousine, who was hit by some debris. It might have been a piece of concrete. He's watching the motorcade when the first shot rings out, and he feels something sharp hit him in the cheek. It was a piece of cement from the curb, and, and all of a sudden his, his cheek starts bleeding. So clearly the first shot completely missed the motorcade. So this left the Warren Commission only two shots to work with to explain all the wounds. So they knew that one bullet had to kill Kennedy via a headshot. So there goes one, you're only, you're only left with one more shot. With that one shot, you have to explain everything else. So that's where Arlen Specter rode to the rescue on his shining white horse and invented the magic bullet theory. Otherwise known as the single bullet theory. And so now begins the saga of the single bullet theory. That's Dr. Wecht again, and he deserves a full introduction. He's a highly decorated forensic expert who's done more than 17,000 autopsies and who's been probing the JFK assassination since the 1960s. He's one of the most vocal critics of the Warren Report and the single bullet theory. Enter Arlen Specter at that time, junior legal counsel for the Warren Commission. Specter, to his credit, came up with what seems to be a solution for them, and that is known as the single bullet theory. You'll remember Arlen Specter from our last episode. The journalist Gaten Fonzie pressed him on his single bullet theory. And when he gave Fonzie an evasive answer, Fonzie published a scathing article. The single bullet theory holds that one bullet entered the president's back to begin with, moved upward, moving then inside the president's chest 11 and a half degrees upward. How in the hell is that possible? When the bullet comes out, it's moving again downward, leftward, and forward, turns in midair, comes back 18, 20 inches, and hits calmly behind the right armpit, exiting below nipple level. The bullet in midair turns upward, sweeping motion, goes into the wrist, causes a comminuted fracture of one of the two long bones from the elbow to the wrist, exits from the wrist, re-enters the governor's left thigh, and that is the pathway of the single bullet. The bullet presumably leaves the gun from the sixth floor of the building that's now above and behind Kennedy. And the bullet enters President Kennedy's back. Looking at a picture of the president's jacket, which you can easily find online, the bullet hole is in the upper middle part of his suit coat. Right. Then it supposedly turns upward and comes out of his throat. Well, my colleagues or others who try to defend that single bullet theory, they say, well, what if the president were bent over tying his shoe? No, he wasn't doing that. He was looking at the crowd and cheering and waving. It's pretty clear when you watch the Zabruder film, he is not hunched over. The president is poised upward toward the crowd. When Governor Connolly testified to the Warren Commission. That's Dick Russell. He repeated multiple times that he was not hit by the same bullet that had hit JFK. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Zapruder film, you'll see that when Kennedy reacts to getting hit in the throat, Connolly then turns around to see what happened. Then, moments later, he gets hit. There's no way that it can be the same bullet that hit Kennedy. The surgeons who operated on Governor Connolly's wrist and chest wounds at Parkland also noted that they did not think all of his wounds had been made by the same bullet. It seems to me people are divided into two camps, right? There are people who believe the single bullet theory and people who think the single bullet theory is crazy. If you believe it, then you believe that one bullet caused all that damage. But it's not just about the path of the bullet. 
To fully consider the single bullet theory, you have to ask yourself two questions. The first question, how did the bullet look when it was recovered? If God came to me and said, Wecht, I want you to get rid of every single piece of evidence and I'll allow you to keep one thing, one thing only, that would be the bullet as it was recovered. And it is nearly perfect condition. You can see a picture of that bullet in the National Archives. It's listed as a Warren Commission Exhibit 399, a bullet that went in and out of both Kennedy and Connolly, breaking Connolly's bones, still looked pristine. Which brings us to the second question. Where did they find the magic bullet? What happened later on was that a maintenance man finding the ER corridor blocked by a stretcher, bent down to move the stretcher, and lo and behold, there was a bullet. A bullet, pristine. Nobody had seen this bullet. Missed by everybody at Dallas, missed by everybody at Parkland, before then, and so on. That was the official story. This pristine bullet just appeared on a stretcher in Parkland a mystery that has confused researchers for decades. Until in September 2023, there was a bombshell. A Secret Service agent named Paul Landis was on the running board of the car behind Kennedy. New bombshell claims tonight by one of the Secret Service agents who was closest to John F. Kennedy when he was assassinated. A new version of what might have happened to the magic bullet. Former Secret Service agent Paul Landis, who was with the president that day, is opening up for the first time about what he witnessed. That according to the New York Times, could quote, change the understanding of what happened in Dallas in 1963. So Rob, I saw this story in prime time on CNN, on NBC. It was in People Magazine. It was in Vanity Fair. It was in the New York Times. They all covered it. Right, and, and Paul Landis was kind enough to talk with us. Paul, from where the president was sitting, how far behind were you? Probably 15, no more than 20 feet. Can you just describe what you saw at the moment that the president was hit? Shortly after the second shot, I heard the third shot. I saw the president's head uh, Split wide open, a mist of blood and flesh and mm. green matter flew into the air. Uh. I ducked to avoid getting splattered. And at that point, we zoomed under the undercast and we were on our way to Parkland Memorial Hospital. I raced to the president's limousine. Mrs. Kennedy was sitting on left center of the rear seat. There was a pool of blood next to Mrs. Kennedy and as soon as she stood up, uh, right behind where she had been sitting, there was a pristine bullet. I picked this bullet up. It, it was not disformed other than it had recognized striations on it that it had been fired. And looking around, everybody was concentrating on the president. I didn't know what to do right away, but I... Uh, I was afraid this, this bullet was, was an important piece of evidence, and I didn't want it to get lost, so I slipped it in my pocket, and we raced in with the gurney carrying the president's body, and we arrived at trauma room one. People were shoving, pushing, shouting. I happened to be pushed up right next to his feet, so I reached into my pocket, took it out, and placed it by the president's left shoe. So what does this tell us? Unless the single bullet theorists are going to claim that the bullet, after going through Kennedy and Connolly, was able to bounce back from where it allegedly exited Connolly's body in the front seat and somehow wound up in the back seat, it can't be the same bullet. What Landis is telling us finally makes sense. First, it explains how a bullet got onto a gurney at Parkland. He put it there. And second, it explains why the bullet was in near pristine condition. It never broke any bones on its path through two people. This completely destroys the single bullet theory. There is no magic bullet, which means that 
there had to have been at least a fourth shot, which means there had to have been another shooter. And we know conclusively that Oswald could not have fired four shots in that time span. This points directly at a conspiracy. So then what's weird to me as a journalist is this new testimony. Like, he never mentioned this when he was questioned 60 years ago? He was never questioned 60 years ago. Nobody ever asked. Warren Commission never interviewed any of the other agents that were in the follow-up car. Now let's talk about the number of shots fired. Remember, the Warren report said that three shots were fired. The Manlicker Carcano, a non-automatic carbine, which was the alleged murder weapon used by Oswald, was tested by top marksmen, and it was determined that it took 2.3 seconds from shot to shot without allowing time for re-aiming and repositioning at a moving target. They determined that the first shot that hit Kennedy was followed by a second shot at 1.5 seconds. Well, how was that possible when it was determined that it took 2.3 seconds from shot to shot? As they say, do the math. The single bullet, the timing of the shots, we're just getting started. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news... We invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and you might know me from the Bedtime Story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, Cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys. Old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out, like you said. I remember I took the chicken, because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's take a look at some of the testimonies from the Parkland doctors who tried to save Kennedy's life. According to the Warren report, JFK's car raced from Dealey Plaza to Parkland Hospital, and it arrived at 12.35 p.m. Everyone at Parkland was on high alert getting ready for Kennedy's arrival. Among them was Dr. Malcolm Perry, a trauma room physician. He worked feverishly trying to keep the president alive. But once the president was pronounced dead, later that day, he talked to the press and he described the shot to Kennedy's neck as an entrance wound. The New York Times published the transcript from that press conference. It goes, reporter, where was the entrance wound? Dr. Perry, there was an entrance wound in the neck. Reporter, which way was the bullet coming on the neck wound? Madam? Dr. Perry, it appeared to be coming at him. Reporter, you think from the front in the throat. Dr. Perry, the wound appeared to be an entrance wound in the front of the throat. Yes, that is correct. 
Well, so that's pretty clear. Yeah, one would think. But uh, it's not the way Dr. Perry's story ends. According to information we have just received from a recently discovered notebook kept by Martin Stedman, we've learned a little more about this story about Dr. Perry. That's Dr. Mantic again, now talking about the journalist Martin Stedman. Stedman covered this story for decades. A week after the assassination, Stedman and a few colleagues went to visit Dr. Perry at his home in Dallas. And they asked him, well, Dr. Perry, what do you really believe? Do you think this was an entry wound? And he said, absolutely, it was an entry wound. And he told them what had happened the night of the autopsy and the morning after. He said he had gotten several calls from the autopsy room, from the autopsy doctors, who told him that if he didn't change his mind about the entry wound, he was probably going to lose his medical license. And so the journalist finished up by asking him, well, Dr. Perry, after all of this, what do you really think? He said, it was an entry wound. So he says, again, it's an entry wound. After a long, long paragraph of assumptions, he finally admitted to the Warren Commission that it could have been a shot from the rear. But this is the guy who repeated three times that the bullet entered from the front of the throat. Right. Why would he change his mind? In the 1970s... That's Dick Russell. A Dallas Secret Service agent named Elmer Moore confessed that he, quote, had badgered Dr. Perry into making a flat statement that there was no entrance wound in the neck. He said he was operating under orders from Washington and the Secret Service. He said he regretted it, but that, quote, we all did everything we were told or we'd get our heads cut off. Perry wasn't the only one that day who said that the shots that hit Kennedy were fired from the front. Statements from 21 witnesses at Parkland Hospital that day reported seeing a massive head wound in the back of Kennedy's skull. The doctors at Parkland described a big wound that reached into the posterior part of the skull on the right side. The journalist Connie Critzberg interviewed some of those doctors at Parkland in the immediate aftermath of that day. She got testimony from one of the neurosurgeons, Dr. Kemp Clark, who also said that there was a huge wound in the right rear of the president's head. And then there's Dr. McClellan, one of the surgeons that worked to save the president's life that day. Dr. McClellan testified to the Warren Commission that part of the cerebellum was blasted away. There was a big hole in the back of his head. That's Dr. Mantic again. It was the size of an orange, at least, if not even a little larger. And dozens, literally dozens of witnesses have said the same thing. So the shot that killed the president came from the front. It's totally consistent with the big hole in the back of the head. So were the doctor's testimonies just ignored by investigators and by the folks on the Warren Commission? One of the doctors, Ron Jones, said that assassination investigators knew of reports of a second shooter, but ignored them. A Warren Commission investigator is said to have told him, quote, we have people who would testify that they saw somebody shoot the president from the front but we don't want to interview them. And I don't want you saying anything about that either. And who was that investigator? Who? Arlen Specter. The creator of the single bullet theory. The same. Now let's dig deeper into what happened during the autopsy at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. The Dallas doctors were unanimous. If you study their treatment notes, that they wrote the day of the president's death. That's Doug Horn. It's that the president had a big blowout in the right rear of his head, behind his ear, the right rear portion of the head. Well, the problem is that the autopsy photographs show the back of the head to be intact. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and you might know me from the Bedtime Story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. 
When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys, old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out, like you said. I remember I took the chicken, because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So, Dr. Horn, if the autopsy photographs in the archives don't show a gaping wound in the back of his head, what do they show? The autopsy photographs show the back of the head to be intact. But that's contradicted by the treatment notes of the Parkland doctors and by their testimony in 1964. So the government had a problem. If those photographs had made it into the official record, that would have supported the observations of the Parkland doctors because the right cerebellum would have been almost totally destroyed, most of it missing, much of the uh, rear of the brain missing. When we look at the photographs of the back of his head at the archives, everything is totally intact. That's Dr. Mantic again. It looks like the hair has just been freshly washed with hardly any blood anywhere. And yet the shirt is totally soaked with blood. How is that possible? A woman named Sandra K. Spencer processed the photos that were taken of the president's head during the autopsy. In November 1963, she was a petty officer in charge of the White House Laboratory at NPC, the Naval Photographic Center. Here she is being interviewed by the ARRB in the 1990s. Can you tell me whether those photographs... The questioner says, can you tell me whether those photographs correspond with the photographs you developed in November of 1963? No. She says, no. Let's start with a conjecture as to whether the photographs that you developed... The The questioner says, let's start with a conjecture as to whether the photographs that you developed and the photographs that you observe today could have been taken at different times. I would definitely say they were taken at different times. She says, I would definitely say they were taken at different times. Of course, the actual authentic autopsy photographs did show a big hole in the back of the head. And we have several witnesses at the autopsy who, who saw those photographs and their testimonies in the record today. To be clear, what you're saying is that the photos that Sandra K. Spencer developed are not the ones that are in the National Archives. I did a chain of custody study on the autopsy report while I was at the review board. And so the first thing I discovered is that Dr. Humes had two sets of conclusions. That's what makes it all the more remarkable that he burned his first copy. Sometime after the FBI agents left, Humes made this new pronouncement because somebody had called Dr. Perry at Parkland Hospital. How do we know this? Perry told Nurse Bell the following day, she said, you look like hell, what's wrong? And he said, well, I didn't get much sleep last night. And she said, why? And he said, well, they had me on the phone off and on all night long from Bethesda Naval Hospital. People were trying to get me to change my mind about the fact that the president was shot in the throat from the front. They wanted me to change my mind and say that was really an exit wound in his throat. This was all happening the night of the assassination. Humes and Boswell met the next morning on Saturday 
to review the first draft of the autopsy report. They met at 10 o'clock in the morning. Humes worked on it all night at home, and it was typed. Boswell told us this under oath. Somebody that day rejected that report because what does Humes do on Sunday? He burns the first draft of the autopsy report and most of the original notes in his fireplace. Okay, so where does this leave us? Sum it up for me. Okay. The Warren Commission manipulated the evidence to fit their single bullet theory in order to prove that Oswald was a lone gunman who shot the president from behind. Several witnesses, many of them medical professionals, who saw Kennedy's wounds at Parkland Hospital that day, contradicted this. They said that the president's wounds were a result of shots that came from the front. The autopsy report, conducted by doctors who had very little experience with gunshot wounds, who had burned the original report, contained photographs that had no correlation to the wounds observed by the Parkland doctors or the photographer who initially took the pictures. All of this points to the shooters in locations other than just the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. And that means that whatever Lee Harvey Oswald was doing that day, he did not do it alone. You seem convinced that the forensics lead to the conclusion that there had to be more than one shooter. So then why is the official narrative still one of a lone gunman? You know, it's perfect that you use that word, narrative, because the evidence was going to show that Oswald was part of a narrative, a narrative that he was completely unaware of. And when you take a look at his journey into this narrative, the picture will become a lot clearer. Next time on Who Killed JFK? If you don't learn who Lee Harvey Oswald really was, there's no way you can understand what happened on that day. We'll pull back the curtain on Lee Harvey Oswald. I was under the impression that Lee was being trained for a specific operation. He was of interest to the highest counterintelligence officer in the CIA for four years before President Kennedy was killed. Who Killed JFK is hosted by Rob Reiner and me, Soledad O'Brien. And our executive producers are Rob Reiner, Michelle Reiner, Matt George, Jason English, David Hoffman, and me, Soledad O'Brien. Our writer is David Hoffman, with research by Dick Russell. Our story editors are Rob Reiner and Julie Pinheiro. Our senior producer is Julie Pinheiro. Our producers are Tristan Nash, Dick Russell, Michelle Goldfein, and Amari Lee. Our editors are Tristan Nash, Julie Pinheiro, and Marcus DeLauro. Our project manager is Carol Klein. Our associate producer is Emilce Quiros. Mixing, mastering, and sound design by Ben LaHoulier. And archival audio in this episode, thanks to the Sixth Floor Museum and Dick Russell. Research and fact-checking by Girl Friday and Emilce Quiros. Business Affairs by Hernan Narea and Jonathan Furman. Our consulting producer is Roseanne Gallini. Recorded in part at CDM Studio and 4th Street Recording Studio. Show logo by Lucy Quintanilla. Production assistance by Rocco Del Prior and Grace Barron. Special thanks to Joe Honig, Rose Arce, and Dan Storper. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Who Killed JFK is a production of Soledad O'Brien Productions and iHeart Podcasts. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. 
explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture, appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibustering. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games... You've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like, easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news... We invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture. Appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibustering. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games... You've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You're just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. In 1974, just months after the Watergate scandal ended with Richard Nixon's resignation, another man who, for decades, had also helped shape America's place in the world was quietly dismissed from his job. William Colby, who was then the head of the CIA, fired spy master James Jesus Angleton. Colby made the decision after a front-page expose in the New York Times revealed that Angleton was running a massive domestic spying program. The CIA was spying on 10,000 Americans involved in the anti-war movement and other dissident groups. Colby had been trying to get rid of Angleton for years, but Angleton was a bit of a legend. He was the head of counterintelligence for the CIA, and for better or for worse, He was one of the agency's founding fathers. Journalists who were hoping to be the next Woodward and Bernstein were all over this story. They wanted to know why. The buzz around Angleton's firing prompted the formation of a special Senate committee headed up by Idaho Senator Frank Church. And for the first time in the CIA's history, their dirty laundry was about to be exposed. The Church Committee published its final report in April of 1976. It revealed a trove of secret abuses at the hands of the CIA, NSA, FBI, and the IRS. Before and after the Cold War, these agencies were involved in global assassination conspiracies, infiltrating news programs, and conducting mind control experiments through programs like MKUltra. The committee's revelations shocked Americans. We'll get into all of that over the next few episodes, but for now, what's important to understand is that in the 1960s, James Jesus Angleton had control over a network of spies, informants, and double agents that reached into the farthest corners of the globe. And the events that would be the cause of his dismissal 
were just getting underway. This is Who Killed JFK. 60 years later, what can we uncover about the greatest murder mystery in American history? And why does it still matter today? I'm your host, Soledad O'Brien. Welcome to the counterintelligence world of James Jesus Angleton, a world he referred to as the wilderness of mirrors. The term wilderness of mirrors points to the tactic of deception and disinformation that both the CIA and the KGB used against each other during the Cold War. It's a world where it's virtually impossible to tell what is reality and what is merely a reflection of reality. And our journey into the wilderness starts with Lee Harvey Oswald. So let's recap. Oswald was a disenchanted young man who found himself in a psychological study run by a doctor with connections to the CIA. At age 17, he enlisted in the Marines and was shipped to Japan, where he received a security clearance to work as a radar operator on U-2 spy planes. Upon returning to the United States, he spent time at a base in California and another base in Nags Head, North Carolina, which focused on special operations. Then, after learning Russian, he defected to the Soviet Union. Two years later, he returned to the United States with his Russian wife and baby and was welcomed back with open arms. He was never questioned. Why? Well, Oswald didn't actually renounce his U.S. citizenship when he was in Russia, even though he tried at the embassy. So maybe they didn't take him all that seriously. Maybe they saw him and thought, "Eh, that guy, you know, he's all bark and no bite. There's this philosophical theory, I know you know, called Occam's Razor, right, that says the simplest answer is often the correct one. So if you apply that here, what if he's just a communist sympathizer? What if he just defected? He just came back to the U.S. and sort of slipped under the radar. It's possible. But don't forget, we are at the height of the Cold War. The fear of nuclear annihilation is hanging over our heads. Now, if you are willing to enter that wilderness of mirrors with me, by the time we exit, I think things will become clear. But I have to warn you, before things become clear, they will become confusing. And in fact, confusion is the point. So why don't we try to embrace the confusion and step into the wilderness of mirrors? During World War II, America had an intelligence gathering agency called the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. The information that they were able to gather helped us win the war. The OSS was officially disbanded in 1945, but certain factions of their work continued. America's biggest enemy at the time was the Soviet Union, and for years they had been honing their skills of covert intelligence operations. So, in an effort to play catch-up, the OSS was revamped into a full-blown intelligence-gathering agency in 1947. It was called the CIA. In the wake of its creation, President Harry Truman drafted Directive 10-2, which was a top-secret memo that gave the CIA the green light to engage in different forms of warfare, including propaganda, sabotage, and deadly covert operations against anyone it deemed, quote, hostile to the United States. Think of the uh, 10-2 memo as uh, marching orders into the dark arts of spycraft. And to protect the president, the CIA developed a practice called plausible deniability. If the president wasn't told about a particular secret plan, then he could plausibly deny having anything to do with it. Plausible deniability empowered the CIA to act without presidential approval. They would carry out missions with no awareness outside the agency. Accountability was intentionally clouded. Soledad, could you read this for me? The better you lied and the more you betrayed, the more likely you would be promoted. I did things that, in looking back on my life, I regret. But I was part of it, and I loved being in it. That is a quote from James Angleton. Now, if you visualize a creepy secret agent from the 50s and 60s, you will see Angleton. I can confirm that. 
Pictures of him show a lanky guy with thick glasses, hollow cheekbones, and translucent-looking skin. Angleton could do virtually anything he wanted under the name of protecting America. He was the chief of counterintelligence, so he was in charge of defending the CIA. But that position required him, enabled him to do anything. And so he was, there was no check on his power whatsoever. That's our old friend Jefferson Morley, creator of JFKFacts.org. Morley wrote the book on Angleton called The Ghost. Why do you call the book The Ghost? Because he was this invisible presence in the U.S. government that nobody could see. I mean, I think President Kennedy knew who Jim Angleton was, but not many people in the U.S. government knew what Angleton did. Describe him. He was very charismatic intellectually. He had been an English major at Yale with a literary bent. He was known as the poet spy. His friend, the poet E.E. E. Cummings, said the following about Angleton, quote, What a miracle of momentous complexity is the poet. He was the spy as intellectual. He was a very creative thinker. People who knew him in his prime were very impressed and regarded him as as, as really something of a genius. Counterintelligence has been described as organized paranoia. To catch spies, you have to be very suspicious of everybody. He referred to his work as the wilderness of mirrors, a phrase that he borrowed from T.S. Eliot. There was information, disinformation, secret agents, and double agents, anything to deceive the enemy, hide the CIA's tracks, and create confusion. Confusion was his weapon of choice. And that confusion came into play when Oswald returned to the United States. Oswald, his Soviet wife Marina, and their infant child June They land on the docks of Hoboken, New Jersey, on June 13, 1962. There, they're met by a man named Spaz Rakin. Rakin was a representative of the Traveler's Aid Society. Now, I want you to take a look at this through the lens of James Angleton. Okay. Spaz Rakin was not only a representative of the Traveler's Aid Society, he was also an official of the anti-Bolshevik nations a group with deep ties to U.S. intelligence, a fact that was totally ignored by the Warren Commission. Now, understand that the Traveler's Aid Society wasn't there to to massage Oswald's feet after his long trip. It was an anti-communist organization that had direct ties to the CIA. Oh, so he's pretty much welcomed back by the CIA. Right, and again, if you look at this through Angleton's eyes, Rakin is the perfect person to meet Oswald in order to make sure that his re-entry into America goes smoothly. Rakin was somebody they could trust and couldn't be tied directly back to them. So Rakin helps the Oswalds get through customs and immigration, then sends them on their way to Fort Worth, Texas. In Fort Worth, Oswald meets a man named George de Morenshield. Now, I'm guessing that name doesn't ring any bells. This is the first time you're hearing the name, George de Morenshield. He's key when we consider the movements of Lee Harvey Oswald on his return to the United States. George de Morenshield was a Russian speaker who worked for oil companies looking for petroleum all over the world. That's Jefferson Morley again. And so in 1962, he was living in Dallas, and he heard of this man who had returned from the Soviet Union, Lee Harvey Oswald. So they become good friends. Don't you think it's odd that a wealthy, worldly, erudite, and much older man would become good friends with Lee Harvey Oswald? DeMorenshield told the journalist Edward Epstein, quote, Somebody gave me Lee's address, and one afternoon I drove to Fort Worth about 30 miles from Dallas. DeMorenshield told Epstein, that a CIA operative, J. Walton Moore, was the person who gave him the address of Lee Harvey Oswald and suggested that he meet him, that he would be doing the CIA a favor. DeMornshield told Epstein that J. Walton Moore asked him to find out about Oswald's time in the Soviet Union. And for essentially babysitting Oswald, DeMornshield was awarded a mineral contract from the Haitian government for $300,000. 
DeMornshield told Epstein that he assumed this was because of the help DeMornshield had given to the CIA. When you think of people who work for the CIA, you think of people who work directly with the agency, but it's not that simple. There are also people who are, for lack of a better term, CIA adjacent. They're assets, and these assets will do favors for the CIA, and sometimes they expect favors in return. So that would describe George DeMornshield. Yeah, right. And and as part of his babysitting duties, DeMornshield introduces the Oswalds to a friend of his. This is a woman named Ruth Payne, who was supposedly interested in learning Russian. Hmm, huh. that's convenient. Dick Russell interviewed Ruth Payne in 1976. The way that you first met the Oswalds was at that party, right? It was a private party. What was it about the Oswalds that you liked? I was especially interested in Marina Mm -hmm. as somebody who was native and Russian. And uh, I didn't really talk to her much that evening, but I did get their address and visited them at their apartment in Dallas. It's important to know who Ruth Payne is. Her sister was a CIA operative, although that was hidden and then denied for decades. Her father was employed by the United States Agency for International Development. For decades, there's been suspicion that the U.S. Agency for International Development was a Cold War policy tool created in 1961 to implement CIA operations around the world. Ruth Payne's husband and other family members had intelligence connections as well. In 1967, when the district attorney from New Orleans, Jim Garrison, tried a case that questioned the Warren Commission's findings, he tried to get the Payne's tax returns, and he was told they were classified. Another little tidbit. Ruth's best friend, Mary Bancroft, was Alan Dulles's mistress. Because of her friendship with the Oswalds, Ruth Payne was a key witness for the Warren Commission. In her testimony, she was asked by Alan Dulles what she suspected Oswald's motive might have been. She said that she always felt that Oswald saw himself as a small person and that he wanted to be greater and to be noticed. George de Mornshield also testified to the Warren Commission and left out many of the key details that he would share later on in his life. Details that may have caused severe damage to the lone gunman case that the Warren Commission was trying to build. And during the time of his testimony, an eyewitness saw DeMore and Shield having private lunches with Alan Dulles. It's like Alan Dulles is everywhere. Yes. He was controlling the flow of information in and out of the Warren Commission. So it should come as no surprise that the Warren report went out of its way to conclude that the Morinshield had no connection to the CIA. But three years later in 1967, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison interviewed the Morinshield and discovered that not only was he connected to the CIA, he was hired by them to look after Oswald. And after talking with Garrison, the Morinshield started to change his public stance. What's interesting about the Morinshield is that he testified to the Warren Commission and really was influential in depicting Oswald as a man who could have killed President Kennedy. DeMornschild came to regret that later in life, and he believed that he was mistaken and that Oswald did not kill the president. DeMornschild wrote about that in his book, which was titled Lee Harvey Oswald as I Knew Him. It's one of the first books written by someone who had a personal relationship with Oswald. After the book was published, DeMorenshield started talking to the press. I interviewed George DeMorenshield twice in 1976. And I remember he said, of course, we know it was a vast conspiracy. And his wife tried to shut him up. And then he stood up and started walking around the room saying, it's defiling a corpse. It's defiling a corpse. Oswald had nothing to do with it. It was remarkable to see him like this. He was really upset. He was revealing something huge. And I wasn't the only person he said that to. He was talking to... Edward Epstein, a journalist who had written about the Kennedy assassination. That's Jefferson Morley again. DeMorin Schill said that he was quite certain Oswald did not kill the president and that he was indeed what he said he was, a patsy. He also said, quote, I would never have contacted Oswald in a million years if Moore had not sanctioned it. 
That's J. Walton Moore, his CIA contact. Right. He said he wouldn't have reached out to befriend Oswald unless he was instructed to. Epstein's interview with DeMore and Shield happened 14 years after Kennedy's assassination. And it was the final interview that DeMore and Shield would ever give. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and you might know me from the bedtime story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys, old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The world is so much weirder than you think. If you want to find out why, join us on the science podcast, Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Want to hear about how horses evolved to gallop entirely on their middle fingers and why some drawings show Julius Caesar's horse with human feet? Or maybe about how some of the earliest experiments creating a vacuum in the lab were conducted by a guy who had the Batman symbol for a mustache. Fans of the show tell us they like the vibe. We try to keep things cozy, relaxed, and open-minded, but driven by curiosity and grounded in a skeptical and scientific perspective. On Stuff to Blow Your Mind, you'll hear everything from the story of how a 19th century inventor created a sort of modified pipe organ that could speak English through a doll's head, to why mud dauber nests are stuffed like a filled pastry full of paralyzed spiders. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out, like you said. I remember I took the because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's set the stage, because with all of these moving parts, it gets very confusing. Okay, so the first few months of 1963 are very tough for Oswald. So he returns from the Soviet Union. He gets a job. He loses a job, having trouble with his wife. And in April 1963, he leaves Dallas, and he decides to go to New Orleans, where he had grown up. In New Orleans, he gets a job at a place called the Riley Coffee Company which is owned by William Riley, a supporter of CIA efforts against Castro. Documents show us that Riley had a relationship with the CIA for years. So we're seeing the same pattern, the same kind of thing we saw with DeMore and Shield in Dallas. Oswald is secretly introduced to another CIA-connected guy whose Riley Coffee Company is located right next to the local FBI, CIA, Naval Intelligence, and Secret Service offices. And it's here in New Orleans where Oswald is about to get sheep-dipped. Sheep-dipped? What does that mean? Sheep-dipped is a term of art in the intelligence world. That means coding someone to give them CIA operative status. 
It's a tactic of deception. It gives the appearance that a person is someone other than who he really is. So how would that even work? By using assets of the agency to build a narrative around that person. You're carefully led into a new identity, and it's all documented. You yourself may not know where this new identity will lead, but when it's finished, you'll have the bona fides of someone to appear completely legitimate. And the plan for Oswald in New Orleans was to sheep dip him in order to make him look like he was a pro-Castro communist. Couldn't he just be a pro-Castro communist? If you think that, the poet spy has succeeded. The poet spy, if you'll remember, is James Jesus Angleton, head of CIA counterintelligence. And the wilderness of mirrors we're in, it's the world he created. We know Angleton's tactics, employ CIA-adjacent people, assets that have enough distance from the agency that they can deny knowing them, then send these people to look after someone the agency is interested in, pick them up at the airport, help them get a job, to manipulate this person they're interested in without being traced back. To what end? Angleton was obsessed with Cuba. He wanted to take down Castro, and this was not in line with the president's agenda. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you remember, Kennedy realized taking a hard line against Cuba could lead to an all-out nuclear war. So he started back-channel communications with Khrushchev and Castro to find a path to peace. But Angleton didn't see that as an obstacle. He said, and I'm quoting here, It is inconceivable that a secret intelligence arm of the government has to comply with all the overt orders of the government. He thought it completely fair game that the CIA, the secret intelligence arm of the United States, could have their own set of rules and directives. So while Kennedy was trying to forge a path to peace, the CIA was conducting major anti-Castro operations out of New Orleans and Miami. They sent boats to harass Cuban ships. They ran guns to exile groups. They even had training camps where they were helping the exiles prepare to mount another invasion. Bill Harvey, the CIA agent who had been demoted and sent to Rome after the Cuban Missile Crisis, played a big part in all of this. Bill Harvey created and led something called ZR Rifle. This was a CIA program designed to assassinate foreign leaders. It wouldn't be until the 1980s that we learned how the CIA had a hand in overthrowing governments in the 1950s and 60s, including Iran, Chile, the Dominican Republic, Guatemala, the Congo. This often included the assassination of the leader in charge. This is some of the dirty laundry we mentioned earlier. The CIA wanted to use that same force in an attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro, and Bill Harvey was at the head of it. To understand Harvey's stance toward Cuba, read a segment of this 17-page memo that he sent to Dick Helms, who was running covert operations for the CIA at the time. It goes, quote, The assurance of no invasion and no support of invasion will, in effect, constitute giving Castro and his regime a certain degree of sanctuary. His belief was that every day that passed that we didn't try to invade Cuba would make Castro grow stronger. Essentially, he's saying, if you're not trying to kill him, You're emboldening him. And in many people's minds, the one emboldening him the most was President Kennedy. A declassified document reveals that Bill Harvey sent his memo to the head of the CIA in November 1962. Six months later, in May of 1963, Angleton published a 27-page paper of his own on the topic of Cuba. This was just about seven months before the assassination of President Kennedy and within weeks of Oswald's decision to move to New Orleans. Angleton's paper was called Cuban Control and Action Capabilities. And it's important to understand who received this paper. The Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, the intelligence chiefs of the State Department, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the Justice Department. And guess who didn't receive this paper? The president. Bingo. Angleton didn't send it to the White House, to his National Security Council, or to the president's brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. And there's one thing that becomes particularly interesting in hindsight. 
the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. The Fair Play for Cuba Committee. The Fair Play for Cuba Committee. If you're taking notes, put a big red circle around the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. The Fair Play for Cuba Committee was a real organization. They had chapters around the country with hundreds of members. Their goal was to provide grassroots support for Cuba in America. In Angleton's eyes, members of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee were pro-Castro agents in the United States. This is exactly what Angleton spent his career trying to protect America against. And so, in order to better understand the organization and hopefully stop them, he needed information. And Oswald was about to be sent right into the thick of it. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and you might know me from the Bedtime Story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys, old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly, and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The world is so much weirder than you think. If you want to find out why, join us on the science podcast, Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Want to hear about how horses evolved to gallop entirely on their middle fingers and why some drawings show Julius Caesar's horse with human feet? Or maybe about how some of the earliest experiments creating a vacuum in the lab were conducted by a guy who had the Batman symbol for a mustache. Fans of the show tell us they like the vibe. We try to keep things cozy, relaxed, and open-minded, but driven by curiosity and grounded in a skeptical and scientific perspective. On Stuff to Blow Your Mind, you'll hear everything from the story of how a 19th century inventor created a sort of modified pipe organ that could speak English through a doll's head, to why mud dauber nests are stuffed like a filled pastry full of paralyzed spiders. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out, like you said. I remember I took the chicken, because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Oswald arrived in New Orleans at almost the exact time that Angleton sent out his Cuban paper. And one of the first things that Oswald does is form a local chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And guess how many members there were in this chapter? A mm, hundred. You're close. One. Just one. Just Oswald. Nobody else. Oswald's behavior with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is kind of strange. In his time in New Orleans... He doesn't spend any time with people who support Castro. Uh, This is Oswald being sheep-dipped. A narrative is being created around him. And what does Oswald know at this point? Probably very little. I mean, he knows he's connected to an intelligence community for some purpose. uh, But I would bet anything that if Lee Harvey Oswald were alive today and you asked him that at that moment, 
What did he think he was part of? I don't think he would even know. After he started his chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, Oswald visited a man named Carlos Bringier, who ran an anti-Castro group called the Cuban Student Directorate. Memos have surfaced that show this group was organized and funded by the CIA. What did Oswald want with him? Oswald told Carlos Bringier that he was an ex-Marine who despised communism and was willing to help train Cuban exiles. So wait a minute. Oswald is starting the pro-Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and at the same time he's offering help in training anti-Castro exiles? Didn't you say the New Orleans branch of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee was funded by the CIA? I did, but remember, so was Carlos Bringuer's student group. And his group was not only funded by the CIA, it was run by George Joannides. Remember him? Joannides was the former CIA agent who sabotaged the investigation led by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. After meeting with Bringuer, Oswald goes to a very anti-Castro area of New Orleans and starts handing out leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. There are photos of this. In, in some of those photos, you can actually see a known CIA operative in the background. Here's a guy who's standing on a street corner in New Orleans, handing out leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And who is filming that? And why is that even being filmed? If you want the public to know something about something, you have to create some kind of event that would make news. So while handing out these pro-Castro leaflets? Four members of the Cuban student directorate confronted him, grabbed his pamphlets, threw them in the air, started shouting at him, and, you know, it was about to be a fight. And two cops came in and arrested them all. The local radio station, WDSU, jumped all over it. The reporter, a guy named William Kurt Stuckey from WDSU, named the Fair Play for Cuba committee in his report and named Lee Harvey Oswald. So what would be the implication of that? They're staging this. How else would the public know that Oswald was pro-Castro unless it was picked up by the press? It had to be documented. Oswald was getting sheep-dipped as a pro-Castro agent. And at the same time, the Fair Play for Cuba committee was being made to look weak. Oswald and the Cubans are all arrested. They're taken into the police station. Oswald, the first thing he does is ask for an FBI agent. Why would a leftist a supporter of Fidel Castro, asked to see an FBI agent. Because it was all theater, and Oswald was in the lead role. To this day, the CIA denies their connection to Oswald. Despite everything we know, some of which we've covered so far in this series, they claim to have had very minimal awareness of Oswald and no direct connection. In June 2023, Peter Baker of The New York Times published a story revealing new details about the CIA and their relationship with Oswald. The story covered a CIA memo from June of 1962 that summarized the contents of a letter between Lee Harvey Oswald and his mother. This letter was intercepted and read by the CIA when it was originally sent. So right there, we have another piece of documentation of the fact that the CIA was fully aware and tracking Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, apparently the existence of this CIA memo wasn't news. Assassination researchers have known that this memo existed for decades. The news that the New York Times was breaking in their story was about the author of this memo, which strikes me as odd that it was more important to the CIA to hide the identity of the person who wrote the memo than the existence of the memo itself. But now that we have a basic understanding of the wilderness of mirrors and the fact that things in this world are often not what they seem, I wanted to talk to someone that could help me understand what the CIA was up to and the significance of the name that the Times uncovered. So we asked Jefferson Morley to join us once again. So, Jeff, who was the CIA agent who was reading Oswald's mail, and who was he sending these summaries to? Ruben Efron was a CIA analyst and translator. He's worked for the CIA for, since 1955. He was in charge of reading the mail of people who were picked by James Angleton. So Angleton had a list of about 200 people whose mail he opened, copied, filed. 
And Oswald was one of those people, starting from the week he went to the Soviet Union in 1959. So it was known that Mr. Efron's role was to surveil the mail of people that Angleton had on this select list. What is it about this memo that stands out? The Times story showed that not only was the CIA reading Oswald's mail while he was in the Soviet Union, when Oswald comes home, Efron writes a memo which he sends to his boss, which says, Mrs. Edgeter in CI SIG will be interested. CI SIG is the Counterintelligence Special Investigations Group. CI SIG was so secret that almost nobody in the CIA, other than Dulles, Angleton, and the people that worked in SIG, knew it even existed. The fact that Oswald's file is controlled at that highest level of the CIA is extremely noteworthy. So what the Times story shows is that not only were they reading his mail, But after he returned to the United States, they were paying close attention to him. And that they would be the poet's spy. Angleton knew all about Oswald. And if you start to connect the dots, when Angleton needed someone in 1963 to play a role in his efforts to take down Castro, he tapped someone he knows, Lee Harvey Oswald. Next episode on Who Killed JFK? We meet Richard Case Nagel, also known as the man who knew too much. By sheer accident, he stumbled on the fact that there was an assassination seriously planned. And then at his preliminary hearing, he says, well, I'm glad you caught me. He says, "Uh, I really don't want to be in Dallas. And I says, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, you'll know soon enough. Who Killed JFK is hosted by Rob Reiner and me, Soledad O'Brien. And our executive producers are Rob Reiner, Michelle Reiner, Matt George, Jason English, David Hoffman, and me, Soledad O'Brien. Our writer is David Hoffman, with research by Dick Russell. Our story editors are Rob Reiner and Julie Pinedo. Our senior producer is Julie Pinedo. Our producers are Tristan Nash, Dick Russell, Michelle Goldfein, and Amari Lee. Our editors are Tristan Nash, Julie Pinedo, and Marcus DeLauro. Our project manager is Carol Klein. Archival audio in this episode, thanks to Dick Russell. Our associate producer is Emilce Quiros. Mixing, mastering, and sound design by Ben LaHoulier. Music by APM. Research and fact-checking by Girl Friday and Emilce Quiros. Business Affairs by Hernan Narea and Jonathan Furman. Consulting producer is Roseanne Gallagini. Recorded in part at CDM Studio and 4th Street Recording Studio. Show logo by Lucy Quintanilla. Production assistance by Rocco Del Prior and Grace Barron. Special thanks to Joe Honig, Rose Arce, and Dan Storper. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Who Killed JFK is a production of Soledad O'Brien Productions and iHeart Podcasts. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture. Appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibustering. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, You've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibustering. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture. Appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. It's September 20th, 1963. A man in a dark suit walks into a post office in El Paso, Texas. He mails three registered letters, then strolls across the street and enters the State National Bank. He approaches the teller and asks for $100 in American Express traveler's checks. As the teller works on his request, the man in the dark suit pulls out a 45 caliber revolver and fires two shots into the ceiling of the bank. As people duck for cover, the man casually exits the bank. An off-duty police officer named Jim Bundren, who is in the vicinity, hears the shots. Believe it or not, I was on my day off. That's Officer Bundren. I heard the shots. Everybody was just, you know, just shocked. Right. And I says, uh, where is he and what's he wearing? And he said, in a blue suit, white shirt, red tie. He, evidently, he had run out of the bank with a gun in his hand. And I know he couldn't have gotten that far ahead of me. Right. When this car pulls out of the alley, then I could see his face was flushed. I could see the white shirt, red tie, and I just, I drew. Uh-huh. And he just, he didn't say anything. Officer Bundren arrests him. And as he's being handcuffed, the man in the dark suit invites the officer to look into the trunk of his car. The officer carefully opens the trunk, and in it, he finds a bizarre collection of cameras, photos, and documents. He had a, a real small an Ulta camera, I think, in the movies they probably call it a spy camera. Right. And he had his own processing lab with it. When I searched his car, he had pictures of top secret, restricted areas, pictures of uh, the inside of compounds, had a lot of pictures of dead bodies. The man in the dark suit is Richard Case Nagel. That's Dick Russell. Richard Case Nagel is a former U.S. Army veteran, three-time Purple Heart recipient, intelligence officer, and CIA operative. Nagel's arrested and charged with attempted bank robbery. And then it was a preliminary hearing. I sat and just talked to him, just like you and I were talking. And he says, well, I'm glad you caught me. He says, uh, I really don't want to be in Dallas. And I says, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, you'll know it's in there. 
Nagel was arrested on September 20th, 1963, two months before President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. This is Who Killed JFK. 60 years later, what can we uncover about the greatest murder mystery in American history? And why does it still matter today? I'm your host, Soledad O'Brien. Now, last episode, we took you through Oswald's bizarre return to the United States. We met his CIA-connected babysitters, George DeMornshield and Ruth Payne, who were tasked with looking out for him. We discussed the time that Oswald spent in New Orleans, where he was arrested for handing out pro-Castro leaflets. We also introduced you to the CIA's head of counterintelligence, James Jesus Angleton, and his Wilderness of Mirrors. Angleton was known as the poet's spy, and he was obsessed with removing Castro from Cuba. Now, it's important to keep all that in mind as we move forward. So what comes next? Okay. In New Orleans in the summer of 1963, while handing out the leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba committee, Oswald gets into a fight with a bunch of anti-Castro activists. He's arrested, and the first thing he does is request to speak to an FBI agent. On September 25th, the White House announces that the president will be visiting Dallas in November. Then we start to see a swell of covert activity. Chess pieces are being moved around the board. Richard Case Nagel, the man in the dark suit who shot two bullets into the ceiling of the bank, he's going to give us insight into how all this covert activity will lead us to a history-changing event. So, Dick, explain to us. Who is Richard Case Nagel? Nagel was a decorated veteran, a Bronze Star Medal winner, and a former intelligence officer. As we mentioned earlier, he first met Oswald in Japan, where they were tasked to try to recruit a Soviet officer to defect. So how did you first encounter Nagel? I first heard about him from another JFK researcher in the 1970s. I was intrigued hearing about this Bronze Star Medal recipient that claimed to have known Oswald, so I did some research. I went to El Paso, where he was arrested for the so-called bank robbery. I went through the newspaper and court files there. There were both Secret Service and FBI files saying that he requested, quote, to speak to a Secret Service agent about an urgent matter the afternoon of the assassination. I knew I'd stumbled onto something, so I found out where he lived. I traveled to Manhattan Beach in Southern California, and I just knocked on the door. And this shadowy figure with a scar across his face opens the door and asks me what I wanted. I told him I'd come all the way from New York to interview him. After an uncomfortable silence, he let me in. And once we sat down, I asked if I could tape him. And he looked at me and said, uh, no, but I'm going to tape you. So he turned on his tape recorder and we started to talk. And he spoke cryptically, but it was about knowing Oswald and that he'd been involved in the assassination. For some reason, he seemed to trust me. So we agreed to meet again this time at a seedy dive bar because he was aware that his movements were being tracked. And it was there that he told me that what he knew about the assassination had ruined his life. The two continued to meet for 15 years, and eventually, in 1992, Dick published his 824-page book about Nagel called The Man Who Knew Too Much. So take me back to where this all started for Nagel. In Japan in 1957 and 1958, Nagel was working for a top-secret Army intelligence unit that was closely connected to the CIA. It was called Field Operations Intelligence, or FOI. The American public didn't know that FOI existed until Nagel described its mission in a 1974 court document. He said it was, quote, a covert extension of CIA policy and activity designed to conceal the true nature of CIA objectives. He then went on to say, quote, in the event I was apprehended, killed, or compromised during the performance of my illegal FOI duties, the Department of the Army would publicly disclaim any knowledge of or connection with such duties. In the early 60s, when Nagel came back to the United States, Cuba had become the focus of American intelligence. The CIA gave Nagel the assignment of renouncing his American citizenship 
and approaching Soviet intelligence to offer his services, much like they'd done with Oswald. And the Soviets then recruited him for their own intelligence gathering. So he became a double agent. Correct. The Soviets gave him two missions. One, penetrate a violent group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles. And two, keep an eye on Lee Harvey Oswald, who had just returned to America. And were those two missions related? At first, there was no relationship between Oswald and that particular group of Cuban exiles. But in the summer of 1963, Nagel went to New Orleans, and that's where he was reconnected with Oswald. He learned that Oswald was being brought into plans that he didn't fully understand, and that plots to assassinate Kennedy were being discussed. Oswald was being primed to be the fall guy. But the Soviets, who had become fully aware of these plans, didn't want Kennedy killed, and they didn't want Oswald to be blamed. They knew it would be pinned on them or Cuba and could trigger a nuclear war. So what did the Soviets want Nagel to do? They wanted him to take Oswald out. You mean to kill him? Yes. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and you might know me from the Bedtime Story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys, old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The world is so much weirder than you think. If you want to find out why, join us on the science podcast, Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Want to hear about how horses evolved to gallop entirely on their middle fingers and why some drawings show Julius Caesar's horse with human feet? Or maybe about how some of the earliest experiments creating a vacuum in the lab were conducted by a guy who had the Batman symbol for a mustache? Fans of the show tell us they like the vibe. We try to keep things cozy, relaxed, and open-minded, but driven by curiosity and grounded in a skeptical and scientific perspective. On Stuff to Blow Your Mind, you'll hear everything from the story of how a 19th century inventor created a sort of modified pipe organ that could speak English through a doll's head, to why mud dauber nests are stuffed like a filled pastry full of paralyzed spiders. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out like you said. I remember I took the chicken because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. They wanted him to take Oswald out. You mean to kill him? Yes. Nagel was trapped. His loyalty was to the United States. He knew he couldn't do it. But he also knew that if he ignored the orders from the KGB, they would take him out. Talk about between a rock and a hard place. So what does he do? First, he tried to warn Oswald that he was being used, 
So walk me through that. How did he warn him? He meets with Oswald in Jackson Square in New Orleans and tries to explain to him that the group of Cuban exiles he's been associated with are not who they say they are, and that he is being used by extreme fascist elements to attempt an assassination on Kennedy in order to justify invading Cuba. Nagel told me that when Oswald heard this, he was, quote, visibly shaken, but denied there had been any discussion about killing Kennedy and just shrugged him off. Nagel knew that when he couldn't convince Oswald, his life would be at risk. So he figured the safest place for him was to be in prison. He told me that just before shooting up the bank, he mailed a registered letter to J. Edgar Hoover detailing what he knew about the assassination plot and sent another warning letter to his handlers in the CIA. Then, to back up his story, he placed a notebook in his car that contained information that only someone on the inside would have had. Several of the notations were virtually identical to what the authorities later found among Oswald's possessions. They both had small Minolta spy cameras. They both had leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And they both had the same unlisted phone number for the Cuban embassy in Mexico City. Did getting arrested save him? It kept him alive for a while, but it ended up ruining his life. He was in prison for four and a half years part of which he spent in a psych ward. That's how they began to build out a narrative that he was nuts. So as a person who's interviewing him, because you're writing your book, how do you navigate that question of his credibility? How do you decide, you know, what's true? First, you assess the existing evidence, which means Nagel's notebook, the fact that he had an ID card for Oswald showing up in his lawyer's files, and the newspaper accounts of his trial in El Paso, where he tried to bring up Oswald and the assassination. Second, interview as many people as possible who knew him, and I found many who attested to his background and credibility. A couple of these, Jim Garrison and attorney Bernard Fensterwald Jr., told me Nagel was the most important living witness to what happened on November 22, 1963. And I realized that the powers behind the cover-up were determined to marginalize him. First, paint him as crazy. Then after he got out of prison, the CIA tracked his movements, and there were a number of attempts on his life. How long were you in contact with him? I met with him periodically for more than 20 years, and during that time, I saw a man who was torn. He wanted to come clean, to reveal what he knew, but he knew that if he told everything, he'd be killed, so he would drop hints to steer me in the right direction. Like Deep Throat in Watergate. Right. At one point, he told me that if anything happened to him, there was a record of everything he knew that he kept stored in various locations and that only certain people were aware of. And he believed that's what kept him alive. So he did manage to stay alive. For a while. Then in 1995, when the Assassination Records Review Board was doing its investigation, they heard me talk about Nagel at a conference and decided that they wanted to interview him. On the day the subpoena arrived at his apartment, Nagel was found dead. So you believe that Nagel was killed before he could talk? Let me answer that this way. When I called his son to tell him about his father, his son told me that his apartment had just been broken into and was ransacked. Then he told me about his key his dad had left in his apartment to a storage unit in Tucson. And that in that storage unit was a purple trunk, which contained material his father had kept hidden for years. When he heard what had happened to his dad, Nagel's son flew to Tucson to check the storage unit. He opened it up, looked inside, and the only thing missing was the purple trunk. So was Nagel killed before he could talk? Yeah, I believe he was. And he wasn't the only one. What happened to Nagel happened to others? Remember George DeMornschild, Oswald's babysitter in Dallas? Yeah, you said the last time he talked about the assassination was in an interview he did with a journalist in 1977. What happened after that? A little over a decade after testifying to the Warren Commission that Oswald had acted alone, DeMorne Schill decided he was going to tell the truth about what he knew. So he wrote a manuscript titled, I'm a Patsy, I'm a Patsy, which was later published posthumously as a book titled, Lee Harvey Oswald, as I knew him. When DeMore and Shields started to go public, the House Select Committee decided to summon him. 
De Mornshield was living in Florida at the time, not far from Gaten Fonzie. Remember, Gaten Fonzie is the journalist who challenged Arlen Specter on the single bullet theory. At the time, Fonzie was working as an investigator for the committee. Fonzie goes to De Mornshield's house to talk to him. He isn't home, so he leaves his business card with De Mornshield's adult daughter. He tells her uh, he'll be calling later that night to set a time for a formal questioning. And so when De Marshall arrives home, his daughter tells him about Fonzie's visit, gives him Fonzie's business card. De Marshall puts the card in his pocket, goes upstairs, and the next morning he's found dead with a bullet in his head, with Fonzie's business card still in his pocket. They said he'd committed suicide, but his wife told me it was definitely not a suicide. And Nagel told me the same thing, that he was murdered before he could testify. There was also mob boss Johnny Roselli. Right before he was supposed to testify, he was found chopped up, stuffed into an oil drum, and dumped into Biscayne Bay. There were a number of people who died mysteriously. Within three years after the Warren Commission report was released, 18 key witnesses died of either a heart attack, an accident, or suicide. Something that has always fascinated me is the people who were tangentially involved but managed to survive. Like Ruth Payne. Like Ruth Payne. You'll remember Ruth Payne as one of the CIA-connected people who became close with the Oswald family when they returned to the U.S. On September 25th, the White House formally announces that the president will be taking a tour through Texas, stopping at Dallas on November 22nd. That same week, Marina accepts Ruth Payne's invitation to have her and her baby move in with her in Dallas. Then in early October, six weeks before the assassination, Oswald returns to Dallas, takes a room at a boarding house, and gets a job in a building positioned directly along what will be President Kennedy's motorcade route. And who do you think helped him get that job? Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne. There are so many pieces to this picture. And 60 years later, pieces are still falling into place. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news, we invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai. And you might know me from the Bedtime Story podcast, Nothing Much Happens. I'm an architect of Cozy, and I invite you to come spend some time where everyone is welcome and kindness is the default. When you tune in, you'll hear stories about bakeries and walks in the woods, a favorite booth at the diner on a blustery autumn day, cats and dogs and rescued goats and donkeys, old houses, bookshops, beaches where kites fly and pretty stones are found. I have so many stories to tell you, and they are all designed to help you feel good and feel connected to what is good in the world. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The world is so much weirder than you think. If you want to find out why, join us on the science podcast, Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Want to hear about how horses evolved to gallop entirely on their middle fingers and why some drawings show Julius Caesar's horse with human feet? Or maybe about how some of the earliest experiments creating a vacuum in the lab were conducted by a guy who had the Batman symbol for a mustache. Fans of the show tell us they like the vibe. We try to keep things cozy, relaxed, and open-minded, but driven by curiosity and grounded in a skeptical and scientific perspective. On Stuff to Blow Your Mind, you'll hear everything from the story of how a 19th century inventor created a sort of modified pipe organ that could speak English through a doll's head, to why mud dauber nests are stuffed like a filled pastry full of paralyzed spiders. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What up, y'all? This is Prop. I host a podcast called Hood Politics with Prop. I am a firm believer that if you grew up in some sort of struggle or inner city in America, you understand politics more than you think you do. It's just not been translated in the language that you speak. 
I am here to translate it for you. For example, you know what a filibuster is? Yeah, you do. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games, you've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was when I came home, you know, I was with Joe. You remember Joe from church, his mama in the prayer group with you? You remember Joe? So I, I came, I took the chicken out, like you said. I remember I took the because you said take the chicken out. I had, did you remember I, had, I got an A on that on that math test? You remember when I got that A? So I was going to take that out and then work on you filibustering. You're just trying to stop her from making an immediate decision. That's all filibustering is. And the Congress do it all the time. See what I'm saying? You already know this stuff. So we take these seemingly complex, high ideas and break them down in a way that you and me actually talk. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So, Rob, where do you go from here? Nearly 5,000 records remain withheld. Do you think that in those records is one piece of evidence that details the whole plot? Well, I don't. I really, I don't. The CIA most likely destroyed anything that would be obviously groundbreaking decades ago. So then what you're both saying is that in all the remaining records, there's no smoking gun. I don't think there's anything left that would be considered a smoking gun the way we think of it. The closest thing we have to a smoking gun is a document that the Pentagon kept secret for almost 40 years. This document outlined a plan called Operation Northwoods. The Joint Chiefs of Staff drafted Operation Northwoods in 1962. It remained a secret until decades later when it was quietly declassified in compliance with the JFK Records Act. But even after the document was declassified, the plan didn't reach the public until 2001, when the investigative reporter, James Bamford, revealed the full details in his book, Body of Secrets. He calls Operation Northwoods, quote, what may be the most corrupt plan ever created by the U.S. government. Here's Jefferson Morley. Operation Northwoods is one of the most significant revelations about the JFK assassination to come out in the last 25 years. Operation Northwoods posed this question. What if something were to happen that would convince the American public that the U.S. had to invade Cuba? Something that would force America's hand? Well, stage a violent incident on a prominent target in the United States, and we'll arrange for it to look like Castro did it. Northwoods was what people in the intelligence business call a pretext operation, where you create a pretext for an action, or sometimes called a false flag operation. When you hear the terms false flag or conspiracy theory, you think of people wearing tinfoil hats. But the U.S. government has had a history of false flag operations. In 1898, the sinking of the USS Maine got us into the Spanish-American War. The USS Maine was a U.S. battleship that mysteriously exploded in Havana, Cuba in 1898. Remember the Maine was the famous rallying cry after the press claimed that Spain was to blame for the explosion, which killed 268 sailors. When the government declared war on Spain, they had the overwhelming support from the American public. And that's how the Spanish-American War started. There was also the firing on U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin in August of 1964, which got us into the Vietnam War. And in 2003, the assertion that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction was used to justify the invasion of Iraq. False flags and disinformation can be very effective tools to rally public support. This is in the actual Operation Northwoods document. Here's what it says. The Joint Chiefs of Staff have considered the attached memorandum for the pretext which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. The Northwoods plans were very detailed. We'll fake the hijacking of a plane, and we'll take the plane somewhere, and we'll say that Castro did it. Understand, people who would die on that plane would be American citizens. This phrase is actually written into the Northwoods plan. Quote, Casualty lists in the U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. Basically, killing American citizens. That's astounding. A hijacked plane wasn't the only option. Operation Northwoods lists 11 other ideas for, quote, 
well-coordinated incidents that would look credible, including sinking ships and burning aircrafts. Uh, There's one more part that I'd like you to read. Okay, here's what it says. The desired result from the execution of this plan would be to place the United States in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances from a rash and irresponsible government of Cuba and to develop an international image of a Cuban threat to peace in the Western Hemisphere. Operation Northwoods was kept hidden from the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee. It was only declassified in 1997. Did Kennedy know about Operation Northwoods? Kennedy knew about it. What was Kennedy's response? He rejected it in in pretty brusque, almost rude terms. But on November 22, 1963, a spectacular attack on a U.S. target occurred. And the immediate response was to blame Cuba. November 22, the day President Kennedy was murdered. So you're saying the plan that President Kennedy rejected was the plan they used to kill him? Right. It was a violent act against a prominent American target. And they had their allegedly pro-Castro assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, to take the blame. And so that's what happens. Within hours of Kennedy's assassination, Oswald is arrested and CIA propaganda assets go to work to link him immediately to the Castro government. And those those efforts are quite successful. We have the headlines the next day, pro-Castro marksman kills the president, pro-Cuban assassin. Robert Blakey, former chief counsel and staff director of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, told us something similar. If what happened is what I think happened, I think that Lee Harvey Oswald was developed as a false flag assassin. On the next episode of Who Killed JFK? President Kennedy had alienated much of the U.S. establishment by the time he was killed in Dallas. We look directly at our three main suspects. That Miami CIA field office is more or less the puppeteers of this whole operation. I asked my mom, where's Papa? And she said he's in Dallas on business. I'm telling you, there's no way in hell that it could not have been a conspiracy. Who Killed JFK is hosted by Rob Reiner and me, Soledad O'Brien. And our executive producers are Rob Reiner, Michelle Reiner, Matt George, Jason English, David Hoffman, and me, Soledad O'Brien. Our writer is David Hoffman, with research by Dick Russell. Our story editors are Rob Reiner and Julie Pinedo. Our senior producer is Julie Pinedo. Our producers are Tristan Nash, Dick Russell, Michelle Goldfein, and Amari Lee. Our editors are Tristan Nash, Julie Pinedo, and Marcus DeLauro. Our project manager is Carol Klein. Our associate producer is Emilce Quiros. Mixing, mastering, and sound design by Ben LaHoulier. Research and fact-checking by Girl Friday and Emilce Quiros. Archival audio in this episode, thanks to the Assassination Archives and Research Center and Dick Russell. Business Affairs by Hernan Narea and Jonathan Furman. Our consulting producer is Roseanne Gallini. Recorded in part at CDM Studio and 4th Street Recording Studio. Show logo by Lucy Quintanilla. Special thanks to Joe Honig, Rose Arce, and Dan Storper. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Who Killed JFK is a production of Soledad O'Brien Productions and iHeart Podcasts. Tune in to the new podcast, Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. If you've overdosed on bad news... We invite you into a world where the glimmers of goodness in everyday life are all around you. I'm Catherine Nikolai, and I'm an architect of Cozy. Come spend some time where everyone is welcome and the default is kindness. Listen, relax, enjoy. Listen to stories from the Village of Nothing Much on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's a weird world out there, so lean into the weirdness with the Stuff to Blow Your Mind podcast. Explore the nature of dreams and how dreaming has influenced culture. Appreciate the deep strangeness of terrestrial biology, as well as purely imagined creatures that reveal much about human nature. Explore topics scientific, historical, philosophical, and sometimes monstrous on Stuff to Blow Your Mind. Listen to Stuff to Blow Your Mind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Prop from the Hood Politics with Prop Podcast. And this is what we do here. We take all these highfalutin political ideas and things in the news and explain it to you in a language that we all speak in. Just like, I don't know, take filibustering. Believe it or not, you already know what that is. Because if you got a mama that don't play no games... You've been filibustering your whole life. Hey, mom, no, look, listen, 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 mom. Before you make your decision, what had happened was everything said after that is a filibuster. You just trying to stall her out to avoid the inevitable. Congress do it all the time. See, you already knew. So listen to Hood Politics with Prop on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.